Greetings, adventurers, and welcome to Skill Tree, where we learn how to do just about everything. Okay, I have been a longtime fan of everything Tolkien. And though those consist of, like, magic and great adventures and all that kind of stuff, the, the portion of it that I tend to resonate with the most are the ones revolving around food. Not only going out on an adventure, but those quiet moments when you're with your fellow adventurers, sitting down for a, a not just a meal like a quick, you need it to survive, but a comfortable meal. It's the same thing with D&D when you have one of those tavern scenes where you've got this incredible food in front of you and your friends that you're on this adventure with, and it's just that moment of enjoying each other's company and enjoying that food. Ever since we filmed the project where I made my mighty tent here, we've actually been going out on a lot of little adventures. First to the Reckoning LARP, then on trips just to kind of show how to set up a fantasy tent and make it look cool. And recently on our trip to Pensac, we got to straight up experience that. This camp next to us kind of adopted us in and gave us these grand meals where like they had that, that firelight and delicious food and really great company. And I am just chasing that feeling. So now let's learn how to eat like kings under the stars. To be honest, it might have just been a reason to go camping and eat great food. Can you blame me? This is what it is. But if you're curious to see what kind of delicious delights we come up with, stick around as we level up this skill. Now, as a quick note, this isn't like sponsored by them or anything, but if you're interested in finding kind of quick camping experiences, definitely check out Hip Camp. It's a site we've used recently to find a bunch of the ones that we've been filming at, and this one we found for this episode even had like this badass little swing. It's the little things, but no, it's, it's a really cool site. Definitely check that out. As an additional heads up, because we're looking to make these kind of really nice fancy meals, we're both using shelf stable non-refrigerated stuff as well as a few things we brought in a small cooler. Things like bacon and sausages for the morning and all that. Again, this isn't like if you're ultra light packing or whatever. This is when you're kind of staying stationary somewhere on an adventure with your tent set up and, and other people around you. Okay, so to get this party started, we wanted to begin at like this base level. How could we make something that was both really posh, but super, super simple to put together? And for that, my go-to here ended up being a charcuterie board. Now, if you haven't had one before, a charcuterie board basically consists of just like cured meats, cheeses, nuts, fruit, all those delectable little finger foods that are both kind of decadent, but really, really simple to put the whole thing together. Kind of basically like an adult version of a snack pack when you think of it. Huh, are snack packs child charcuterie boards? All right, so to make ours, we started strong with some orange marmalade. This is just gonna give us something sweet to dip with. For another interesting kind of dippable thing, we also added some hummus to the mix. This paired with the jelly gives us both kind of sweet and savory options to work with. And speaking of savory, the next thing we busted out was this pack of olives and like pickled peppers. Pickled peppers, which I presume Peter Piper probably picked. Most likely. Now, since we do have all those dippables, the next easiest thing to put on here is obviously some crackers. Now, fun fact, the word charcuterie is derived from the French term charcut, I believe it's pronounced, which means cooked flesh, which is, you know, weird, <laughs> kind of creepy. But it does bring up the point that no charcuterie board is complete without some tasty meats. Now, if you wanted to get really fancy, this is the place to put your, like, prosciutto or capicola. Or you can do like us and just slice up some plain old salami. Then we just added some cheese to this mix, slicing up some comte, and then sprinkling in some soft blue cheese. Last, we just added a whole bunch of mixed nuts that are easy to just pick as we sit and relax. And look, I know, charcuterie board seems really simple, but look at this spread. There's just something that feels, again, bacchanal and luxurious, especially when it's paired with some really good mead. I'm not gonna lie, this was a really great video to shoot, and this meal was so good for us to make because it was so fast. Since we are shooting video, we were losing daylight really fast. It was the end of the day once we got to the camp. And this thing was able to be put together less than 10 minutes. It's delicious, it's fun to pick at. And because there's so much of it, it's easily replenished, it lasted a few hours. Hours which we just kind of got to sit by the fire, tell stories, plan for the next day's meal, like the breakfast we're going to be making. On any other trip, I would have shoved a cliff bar in my mouth and in a few minutes, meals would have been done and I would have been off to the next task. 
but something like a charcuterie board is specifically made to share with other people and have those kind of quiet moments where you're just kind of munching and, and talking and it was really, really comfortable. That said, our cooking adventure wasn't over for the night because what's the point in having dinner if not for just kind of a little, a little prelude, a little, a little foreplay to the dessert. And for this trip, we actually came up with two really easy, fun dessert options. The first one we're gonna be talking about is called Ambrosia, and it's made out of sweet potato. So you know, healthy, Ki kind of. <laughs> now, hearkening back to this episode here where I cooked a Thanksgiving turkey over a fire, I learned that to cook effectively with a campfire, you basically need it to burn down to embers. Embers, rather than flames, are gonna provide a much more consistent heat source, allowing you to just be able to move the item you're cooking a little bit further away or a little bit closer, depending on how much heat you actually need. And cooking sweet potatoes specifically really couldn't be easier. You just kind of throw those suckers in and let them sit pretty much right up against the embers. I also stacked up some wood to almost make like a little oven to throw heat back out. But you don't even really have to do that. Just make sure the potatoes are right close and you should be good. Now the skin is going to blacken up and look kind of nasty. But after only about 10 to 15 minutes, the insides were nice and soft. All you have to do from there is carefully remove them from the fire and take out all their tasty insides, leaving the charred nastiness behind. Then I mashed up those sweet potatoes and topped it off with a bit of brown sugar and some salt. And then finally, a bunch of marshmallows on top. Then it was back to the fire for a few minutes just to get everything nice and melty and gooey. Finally, we added that to one of our nice little wooden bowls and topped the whole thing off with yet more marshmallows because, you know, the health food and, and stuff. It's camping. You can't camp and not have such a stupid amounts of marshmallows. It's like a rule of some sort. Clever, you say. That is surely enough sugar to satiate even the most sweetest of teeth. Absolutely not. But we had another recipe we, we were like desperate to try. So yeah, this one's even easier though. To make this one, all one had to do was slice some bananas down the middle, just enough so we can flay them open, leaving enough space to just stuff a bunch of crap into. We also used a fork just to give little grooves so whatever melty goodness we put in there can find its way deeper into the banana. Again, you can see how healthy this is gonna be. <laughs> From here, you can just add whatever you like. For us, we threw in some chocolate chips and then again topped everything off with, you know, yet more marshmallows. Maddie decided she wanted to add some honey, but even I have my limits to how much sugar, so there was, there was, there was no honey going in mine. Seriously, she's like a hummingbird. She just lives off of sugar. It's ridiculous. Once you've crammed all of the tasty treats you can think of inside of your little banana bowl, just throw them in a pan over a fire and let the laws of thermodynamics work their magic. Soon you will have one of the sweetest, ooey gooeyest, delicious banana treats that's ever passed your lips. Seriously, these two desserts were freaking bananas. I know, I tried to stop myself. It was a bad one. <laughs> But no, they were really, they were so good. The kind of subtle sweetness of that sweet potato, even with the marshmallows in it, was just really kind of pleasant and tasty. Whereas in the banana ones were straight up like ice cream. Like they were hot, obviously, but they were really sweet, like really sweet, but so good. We just rode that sugar high into the night as we discussed how we were gonna go about making breakfast. Seriously, the whole purpose of this trip was just to figure out cooking while camping. And if you've never gone on a camping trip specifically to make delicious foods, I highly recommend it. It was an extremely pleasurable experience. Okay, so speaking of breakfast, the plan we decided to go with was inspired by a traditional English breakfast. This is specifically one of these delicious looking bad boys, consisting of things like beans and toasts, mushrooms, tomatoes, potatoes, bacon, eggs, stuff like that. It's super hearty looking, and to me, it was reminiscent of something you'd see like hobbits eat on an adventure, right? Or just honestly, any day of the week. Something delicious that'll bring you from breakfast all the way to 11sies. Now, of course, we could have went ahead and brought our own bread of some sort to use as like our toast or whatever, but one, bread goes stale or whatever, and two, I don't like it in a little plastic bag because it tends to get soggy as you're camping. And also, we just thought it would be more fun to try to make our own on a campfire. And to be honest, this turned out to be a lot easier than you would think and came out 
friggin' delicious. Now though you don't have to, you can make like a denser bread, we decided to use a yeast mixture to give our bread a little bit of rise. To do this, we started by adding a sugar cube to our little mortar and pestle here to break it down. Then we added that sugar to some warm water to make a tasty treat for our yeast to snack on. Speaking of the yeast, we just added roughly a teaspoon of this dry bread yeast to that mixture for it to proof. If your yeast is still alive, you should see it start to bubble and foam over the next few minutes. With those happy little bastards farting away, we went ahead and started adding our flour mixture to begin to make the dough. Quick side note here, I am allergic to wheat. So the flour we're using is a gluten-free flour that does not rise a lot. It will rise a little bit, it adds a little bit of lift, but it just doesn't do the same as regular wheat flour would. Seriously, you, you lucky people who get to eat just regular wheat have it so easy. Anywho, once enough flour has been kneaded in to make it this kind of dough-like consistency, it was rolled into a ball and then placed into a bowl. That was then covered with a moist cheesecloth and left to rise. Again, since it's gluten-free dough, it actually doesn't rise all that much. But if you're using regular wheat flour, you can expect it to rise about two times the volume in about an hour. So just make sure you give it enough room to grow. So while we waited for that dough to just do what it's gonna do, we decided to cook the rest of our breakfast. Now we brought plenty of ingredients to work with, and I'm not gonna lie, I was really jazzed to get this stuff cooking. Now we decided to start with our potatoes first, as those were gonna take the longest to cook. For these, we basically just sliced them into nice even cubes so that they'd all cook up at the same time. Before throwing those in a pan though, we also grabbed a clove of garlic, crushing it to get the skin off and dicing it up nice and fine. In our nifty cast iron pan, we went ahead and added some oil and let that heat up over the fire until it started to smoke. Then added in the garlic to get all that tasty flavor out into the oil. Once the aromatics had browned a little bit, it was time to add in our potatoes. Again, notice that the fire has burnt down and is off to one side of the pit. And we're actually positioning our pan just off to the side. Putting that pan directly over those embers would actually cause too much heat and would get our outside of our potatoes to burn while the inside isn't cooked yet. By moving it just off to the side of the fire, we get that radiant heat and we can control how hot we want that pan to get. While that was cooked, we added some sausage to another pan and got those browning up as well. Both of these items end up being super easy with the potatoes just needing to be moved around every once in a while and those sausages needing a turn to help them cook evenly all the way around. Once just about finished, I added a little bit of salt and pepper to our home fry and these were ready to go. Luckily, our sausages were also finished around the same time, so both of them hit our platter. And super fast, our breakfast is already looking damn tasty. At least for those with sensible appetites, which really isn't us, so cook on. <laughs> Moving back to our bread, again, it's gluten-free flour, so it didn't rise a whole lot, but it did rise enough for us. For you, though, if you're using wheat, you probably have to poke the middle and kind of punch it back down to release a lot of that gas. For us, though, we simply began kneading it flat so that we can cut it into quarters. Then each quarter was taken and flattened into its own little boule shape, and an X indentation was made on the top just for kind of funsies. These we simply fried in a little bit of oil. It's a really simple recipe, but let me tell you what, they came out amazing. So much so that since the camping trip, I've actually just made these on my stovetop for breakfast. This is actually a Maddie recipe. She had made them in the past and I'd never made bread this way before and it is so good. Not only that, but you can add stuff to it. Like the last one I made, I added some brown sugar to it and a little bit of cinnamon and made them almost like cinnamon rolls. Um, so good. Okay, so we have some potatoes, sausages, some fried bread. Fairly standard breakfast fare here in the States, but here is where this English breakfast kind of veers off of what we're used to. In a lot of those, they add both mushroom and tomato to the mix. Which I'm a fan of both of those things, but they've never been breakfast foods to me, I guess. But they're super simple to prepare. All we had to do was cut those tomatoes in half and then just remove the stalk from our large portobello mushrooms, which were previously washed. These were just added to a lightly oiled and heated pan and left to their own devices to cook up. A complete no-brainer of a recipe, but the char that got on those tomatoes and the meatiness of those mushrooms honestly fit everything else on the plate really well. These should be breakfast foods. They're really great. Now, of course, this wouldn't be any kind of tasty breakfast if it didn't have bacon and eggs in the mix. Now, I'm sure some of you will see it as blasphemy, but we didn't go with your standard bacony bacon. We went with this kind of ham steak style bacon, mostly just because I felt like it worked better with the aesthetic. No magic here, though. You know how to make bacon. Heat it up in a pan. Fry it. It's bacon. 
Same with our eggs, which we just decided to make over medium. Simply placing them in the pan, letting them fry up, and then flipping them over and cooking the other side. Finally, to top this whole thing off, we just heated up some baked beans in a pan over the fire. And with these last elements added to our board, our feast was prepared. I haven't eaten this well at home with all the comforts around me, much less out in the woods off of a campfire. All of these recipes were so simple, but provided this sense of comfort and warmness that is just so hard to match. Picture a meal like this on your next LARP or like some sort of adventure outing or whatever, or even just a regular camping trip. Surrounded by people whose company you enjoy, trading stories, maybe just hanging out by the fire. Honestly, anytime you're just eating incredible food together, especially ones that you've kind of sat together and made, um, it's just such a comfortable experience. I, I highly recommend you give this a shot. It's such a fun little skill being able to cook out and camp that way. And it's instantly rewarding. Again, during our recent Pensick adventure, we had that camp bring us in and I hadn't felt something that comforting, especially in a place where I knew nobody. The whole thing was brand new to me, but those events stand out so much in my mind because that's what great food and good company does. So I definitely hope you give this thing a try during your next outing. If you do, why don't you leave down in the description below the type of stuff that you enjoy cooking at a campfire. In the meantime though, keep leveling up you. Thank you for making it to the end screen. The YouTube algorithm loves when you do, and it's a great way to support this channel. Another great way to support this channel is by joining these incredible people who give to our Patreon. Thanks to their incredible generosity, we're able to keep this bad boy running and keep leveling up our skills. Again, it means the world to me that you're willing to help support this channel. So yeah, thank you for everything you do for us. If you'd like to join their noble ranks, why don't you consider joining our Patreon, link in the description below. Or you can support us by clicking on one of these videos here that YouTube thinks you'd like. Just either of them, they're both good, I'm pretty sure, I guess, maybe. Look at their golden swing.